In a brain scanner at MIT, a subject is wrestling with a similar moral dilemma. Okay, Nick, if you're ready, we're going to do another run of that task where you're reading stories and making moral judgments. If you're ready, can you push the one button? Great, here we go. Nick, the subject in the scanner, is being given a series of stories to read. Running the experiment is MIT's Rebecca Sachs. Okay, so we're posing him basically little moral dilemmas. He's going to read a short story that tells him about something that happened, and at the end of it, somebody does an action. For example, somebody puts white powder in a cup of coffee. And the question for him is, is that morally OK, or does that person deserve moral blame for putting the white powder in the coffee? Now, that, of course, depends what the white powder is yeah, and yeah. whose coffee it is. And did they mean to cause any harm with the white right, powder? exactly. In this story, the white powder is poison in a packet labeled sugar. In one scenario, the perpetrator puts the powder in the coffee knowing it actually to be poison. In another version, he does it believing it really is sugar. In both cases, the victim dies. Astonishingly, Rebecca can tell which version Nick in the scanner is thinking about. What we've discovered is that there's a pattern of activity in one particular brain region. And in that pattern, we can tell whether he's thinking about somebody harming someone else on purpose or accidentally. And you have a wonderful name for that region. What? We do, although remember. no one can ever remember it. I can't it. remember. Yeah. What is it? So it's, a, it's above and behind your right ear, okay. and it's called the right temporoparietal junction. The right temporoparietal junction. Yeah, it's a terrible name. It sounds name. like the name of a TV show. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> we described for Rebecca what happened at our crime scene and the crucial moment when Jimmy turned and fired. Was it with intent to kill or as a panicky accident? So that is exactly the kind of example that poses a really interesting hard problem for Especially this Especially for region. the jury and the judge. What right. was he thinking? Did he do exactly. this with any sense of deliberateness? So you could imagine that if you could look inside the brain of the jury or the judge while they're thinking about that, yeah. their right TPJ, this brain region, would be getting quite a workout trying to yeah. figure out when he did that, did he know there was a person there? Did he intend to hurt the person? Did he intend to pull the trigger of the gun? Did he know that the gun was loaded? When you're figuring out if he should be blamed for what happened, you've got to really be considering in that moment what was inside his head. Inside Nick's head in the scanner, his right temporal parietal junction is also working overtime as he wrestles with a series of stories where serious harm is caused. The amazing part is that within this tiny brain region, the fMRI can pick up one pattern if he thinks the harm was accidental, and another if he thinks the harm was intended. This is where it's, the story is clearly accidental. Yeah. And I'm thinking about the, the accident that occurred. Yeah. Here, the story is clearly, clearly on purpose. On purpose. Yeah. What a completely different picture that is. And this is a different story from this. Exactly. But they're both intentional harm. Exactly. And it's almost exactly the same pattern. So that's exactly what we're talking that's about. That's really amazing that you, that you have such a clear picture of it. But another thing that makes this pattern so neat is that these patterns are different from one person to another. So if I looked for this pattern in your brain, mm -hmm. or if I looked for it in my brain, or if I looked at it in each of the 12 jurors' brains, each one of the jurors would have a slightly different pattern. And one thing that's interesting is it turns out that how different these two kinds of things look in your brain is directly related to how different you say they are in your moral judgments. So if you had a brain like this, that where the pattern for accidents is really different from the pattern for intentional harms, you would say that accidents are much less bad than intentional actions. But if I picked another juror, somebody in whom the patterns are more similar, they would say accidents are almost as bad as intentional action. You hurt her so badly that you were totally morally wrong anyway. And we can see that difference between people by looking at how much of a difference there is in the patterns in their brain. Let me clear something up. You, you don't look forward to the day where jurors will be put in this machine. You're just telling us what's going on That's in their right. head when they do this. Yeah. this if you want to find out whether a juror thinks that this action was done intentionally or accidentally, there's a much cheaper way than fMRI <laughs> to find out. You just ask them. <laughs> right? But when people go to make moral judgments, each of us brings to that the details of the current situation and all of our past experience. And so the reason you have 12 jurors is because everybody's going to bring a slightly different 
a slightly different reasonableness, a slightly different experience of the problem. And what we trust is that if you've got 12, 12 different viewpoints, 12 slightly different right TPJs, 12 slightly different brains in every other way, that what they'll come up with together is a reasonably fair decision.